evening. You're watching the news tonight, your daily roundup of all that has happened across India and the world. I'm Ishan Russell and these are the headlines that we're tracking this evening. Cultural extravaganza at the Wembley Stadium ahead of Prime Minister Narendra Modi's address, meeting with Cameron and lunch with the Queen are the other highlights on a day when India concludes its nuclear deal with Britain. VHP leads BJP and Bajrang Dal enforcing Karnataka Band parties criticize Sidaramaya government for politicizing Tipu Sultan's birth anniversary celebrations. BJP ministers do a tightrope act claim that criticism by party veterans is not directed at the Prime Minister, advise them to air views at party fora. After a decisive battle backed by US-led airstrikes, Kurdish forces will push out Islamic State militants to reclaim the town of Sinjar in Iraq. And India to take on South Africa in the second test tomorrow in Chennai, debutant all-rounder Gurki Ratman likely to be part of the playing 11. Well, our top story this evening, it's been hyped as the centerpiece of uh, the Prime Minister's three-day visit to the UK. Prime Minister Modi's address to an audience of 60,000 people. Built as a chart-topping spectacle, no less than 800 artists from a wide range of cultural genres are performing at the Wembley Stadium. They include Indian dancers, artists from the Royal Ballet, Hollywood pop singers and the London Philharmonic Orchestra. Let's catch the excitement that's happening there. Earlier in the day, a meeting with the British Prime Minister and lunch with the Queen at Buckingham Palace and a meeting with the business community with just a few engagements of the Prime Minister. Let's take a look at his busy schedule in London today. After receiving a warm welcome, Prime Minister Narendra Modi getting assurances from the UK Prime Minister on capital and finance for India's flagship infrastructure projects. On the trade and economic side, the leaders discussed how the UK could partner India in its flagship initiatives like Make in India, Clean India, Smart Cities, Skills India and Digital India. A central outcome of the discussions was the desire on both sides to collaborate in leveraging the city of London as a global financial hub for raising infrastructure financing for India's ambitious infrastructure projects. Supporting Modi, Cameron said he wanted to support the Indian Premier in his efforts to transform India with improved infrastructure and education. A total of five outcome documents and 11 MOUs were finalized today. Speaking at the Guildhall, a historic building in the heart of London's financial district, Modi appealed to British business leaders to invest in a more transparent India. There were a number of regulatory and taxation issues which were adversely impacting on the sentiments of foreign investors. We have taken a very decisive step to remove a number of long pending concerns. Concerns were also raised about India's handling of intellectual property rights. Modi said his government is working hard to improve it. I am personally convinced and want to assure you that India is committed to protect intellectual property rights of all innovators and entrepreneurs. Former Infosys director TV Mohandas Pai praised Modi for marketing India. He's selling India hard and I think Great Britain wants to work with, uh, with uh, India too. The two prime ministers also welcomed a package to promote clean energy worth 3.2 billion pounds of commercial agreements, joint research programs and initiatives to share technical, scientific, financial and policy expertise. Cameron has visited India three times since taking office in 2010 to try to climb up the diplomatic packing order. 
But Modi is the first Indian head of government to pay an official visit to Britain, the country's former colonial ruler, in almost a decade. Bureau report, Rajya Sabha TV. And we're joined by foreign affairs expert S.D. Muni to help us understand, Mr. Muni, apart from uh, the, the, the crowds and uh, the theatrics of uh, the entire visit, which are, of course, uh, an important component as far as uh, the, the Prime Minister's style of diplomacy is concerned, the key takeaways as far as the economy, ease of doing business, and also energy cooperation are concerned, those are really would be critical in taking the relationship between India and the UK forward. Well, that is absolutely true, but in addition to that, also the defense sector. And then overall understanding on issues like terrorism and uh, reforms in the international structure, particularly the United Nations. Uh, you must have uh, taken note of uh, the mention of fighting terrorism, even uh, Pakistan being asked very gently uh, as uh, they should help in uh, nabbing terrorists of 2611 Bombay. So the, it, it's a much wider than uh, simply a question of trade and investments, which has of course been emphasized. And as your report said, I think uh, Mr. Modi is perfect in uh, marketing India outside and also connecting with the people of Indian diaspora. Oh, let's try to understand why that connect is so important, Mr. Muni. Is it about uh, just getting uh, those uh, expatriates to invest in India? Or do you think a larger constituency is being nursed in terms of a larger idea of India itself? Well, this is India's soft power. We, we had uh, been awakened to it, but we had not really uh, pushed it and harnessed it in a very strong manner. You know, there are 1.4 million Indians in, in uh, Britain and many of them are in very, very high positions. There are uh, many Indian companies which have invested there, generated jobs there, and therefore they have an influence in the internal system uh, within Britain. And I think uh, India, for advancing its own interest, must make the best use of them. So besides connecting emotionally with these people, I think they can be a very viable, very subtle, very soft instrument of Indian diplomacy and foreign policy. Yes, and Indian uh, diplomacy certainly leveraging that advantage of the diaspora. But uh, Mr. Muni, this visit also marks a historic shift in ties between uh, India and the UK, where the UK is really ruling out the red carpet. It seems that the UK desperately wants India to be a strategic partner with it, in, uh, both in strategic terms as well as economic terms. Absolutely, more in economic terms. You know, uh, Britain knows very well that there are two major Asian economies which are growing, which have tremendous potential, China and India. And as you uh, must have noticed earlier, uh, that uh, they had a visit from the Chinese uh, president to Britain. And now it is the Indian prime minister who is going there. You may also recall that in the last five years, I think the British Prime Minister visited us almost twice or thrice. And Indian Prime Minister has not gone there for last decade almost. Therefore, the Brits are very keen that somehow India's growing potential must be harnessed and they must connect with it. They have been trying it. Now this response in terms of Mr. Modi's visit has given them an opportunity to showcase that how keen they are to link up with India and have cooperative arrangements with India. Uh, one final question, a very quick response, uh, Mr. Muni. As far as the protests that we've uh, seen also over there in London, or, uh, while they might not be that huge in scale, but certainly they've been noticed this time around, uh, and uh, the Prime Minister also fielding questions on a couple of domestic issues like uh, the allegations of intolerance. So what do you make as far as Prime Minister Modi's message to his domestic constituency is concerned? Well, I think Mr. Modi has to fight and, and, and challenge this uh, kind of a perception and impression because you would recall that uh, uh, Mr. Modi was not welcome in UK uh, until few years back. And uh, there is uh, the recent uh, spillover of what is happening in India internationally in terms of uh, tolerance and various other polarizations which have taken place either during Bihar elections or on the Dadri issue or anything else. There were Sikh demonstrations, there were Nepalese demonstrations, uh, there were people who were asking 
questions on this uh, tolerance and, and acceptability of diversity in India. So I think Mr. Modi had to convey a message that uh, whatever events have taken place are only deviations and distortions, but India will stand for its tolerant, its diversified uh, unity kind of an image. Uh, therefore, uh, I think even this speech would be very important for that. And you would recall that even in the uh, British Parliament, he made a very forceful argument uh, in favor of India's tolerance and diversity. All right, we'll leave it over there. Mr. Mirzi Muni, thank you very much for coming in and helping us understand uh, the implications and the takeaways uh, from the Prime Minister's visit to the UK, intense day over there. But as uh, we talked to Mr. Muni about the protests, because they've marked Prime Minister Narendra Modi's maiden visit to the United Kingdom. Hundreds of Sikh, Nepali and Tamil demonstrators gathered outside Downing Street protesting against alleged human rights violations. Some even criticized the UK government for ruling out the red carpet for Prime Minister Modi. Modi! Modi! Hundreds of people gathered outside UK Prime Minister David Cameron's official residence at 10 Downing Street to protest against Prime Minister Narendra Modi. More than 200 writers, including Salman Rushdie, Ian McEwan and Nikita Lalwani, have signed an open letter to Cameron urging him to raise concerns about freedom of expression in India during their talks. The protests are taking place amid raw over intolerance back home. Till three years ago, Modi was denied visa to UK for a decade over the 2002 Gujarat riots. On Thursday, Modi talked tough against incidents of intolerance during the joint press conference with Cameroon. But the protesters aren't happy with the kind of grand welcome Modi has received on his maiden visit. We all know what Modi is capable of, what he has done in complicit in war crime. And we were very, very angry that he was welcomed here, speaking in our parliament, and shaking hands with the Queen, and also elevated to having a kind of party sort of thing uh, tomorrow. And we're very angry about that. Why do we have to celebrate this criminal? A section of the activists are from Nepal who urged Cameroon to put pressure on Modi to stop blocking trade along the Indo-Nepal border. UK has been open a red carpet. I think UK should not look only into the political and commercial efforts. UK has a rich pride in culture of raising a voice to the voiceless countries, peoples and state. It is, it is the glory of the British values and culture that they should respect and they should give a pressure that you, what you are doing is wrong. We can voice ourselves here and I hope David Cameron is going to do something and talk, talk about this. There is nothing that cannot be solved with the diplomacy and but we need something to be, uh, we need a diplomacy talk going on. Nepal is facing acute shortage of essential supplies since protests began against its new constitution recently. Madhisi protesters have camped along the border with India hampering trade. Facing allegations of aiding the protesters by blocking border trade, India has taken up the matter with Nepal to sort out differences diplomatically. Bureau report, Rajya Sabha TV. Now let's go across to London to our correspondent, Rafa Khanam Sherwani, who's been covering all the goings on as far as Prime Minister Modi's visit is concerned. And indeed, an action packed day, Alpha. We were taking our viewers through most of the highlights of the day. But in terms of the big takeaway, what would you uh, uh, call it? Alpha, can you hear me? Uh, we seem to have be, be, be having a bit of a problem getting across to our correspondent, Alfa Khanum Shirwani. She's, of course, at the Wembley Stadium. So uh, with the lot of noise that the 60,000 uh, people over there gathered to hear the Prime Minister's address are making, that uh, is indeed very difficult for her to hear us. Alfa, can you hear us? Uh, we'll try to re-establish uh, that uh, audio connection with Arfa. Meanwhile, uh, we'll just uh, uh, update you uh, as far as the Wembley Stadium event is concerned. That, of course, is on that big cultural extravaganza with the Prime Minister's speech as the centerpiece. <laughs>
Uh, now, the Vishwa Hindu Parishad forced a statewide band in Karnataka following the death of an activist in clashes over the Tipu Sultan Jayanti celebrations in Madhikeri district. The protest came two lives this week. Public transport services were affected in Bengaluru, Mysuru, Hassan and Chitradurga. The Karnataka Home Minister urged people to remain calm. Markets were deserted in many towns as the VHP called for a Karnataka band. Speakers were off the roads and schools and colleges were given holidays. People were restricted from coming out on the roads in Mangaluru and other areas. The VHP is protesting the death of one of its members in demonstrations against the government-sponsored anniversary celebrations of Tipu Sultan. There seems to be some design in creating this uh, communal disturbance. Uh, we are watching, we are regulating. Uh, we, we have taken all the steps necessary. While the BHP, Bajrangdal and the BJP have blamed the state government for celebrating the occasion, other parties have however blamed the BJP of engineering a religious polarization. Karnataka government needs to introspect and even come out clear about what was the need to create divisions within society. And a member of the VHP has died in the police action. They can't wash their hands of it. Highly condemnable and uh, government should uh, take note of that and uh, should act against uh, such organization which uh, uh, gives uh, such threats to personalities like uh, Girish Karnat. Tipu Sultan is only a symptom of the larger uh, malaise and the malaise is that the RSS, VHP, Bajrang Dal and the Vishwa Hindu Parishad and all the other fellow travelers of the Sangh Paribar are leaving no stone unturned in order to communalize and polarize the situation in the country. On Tuesday, a local VHP leader died and many others, including policemen, were injured in clashes. Death threats to Gyan Peter Wadi, Girish Karnad and BJP MP Prathap Sinha have also prompted the BJP to demand the resignation of the Siddhar Amiya government. Bureau report, Rajya Sabha TV. As the BJP battles a virtual revolt from within over the Bihar defeat, the party claimed that none of the criticism by the veterans was directed at the Prime Minister. Union Minister M. Venkaya Naidu said that the party veterans should have raised their voice at party forum rather than going public. He also defended BJP President Amit Shah that he played a crucial role in strategizing the party and organizing the campaign during the elections. On Tuesday, BJP veterans LK Atwani, Murli Manohar Joshi and Yashwan Sinha came out with scathing statements against the top leadership. They alleged that the party's stand of collective responsibility for the Bihar poll debacle was a means of shirking responsibility. Some of our senior leaders have raised certain issues. It would have been better if these issues were raised in the party forums rather than public. The parliamentary board has already decided to take up with all the concern and discuss the shortcomings that led to the verdict of Bihar. The Defence Minister Manohar Parikar today criticised the former servicemen protesting over the one rank one pension scheme. Condemning the burning or returning of gallantry medals as an insult to the nation, Parikar asked protesters to instead put their grievances to a judicial committee. He also alleged that the army veterans' protest was politically motivated. On Saturday, the, Saturday, the government notified the scheme that will benefit around 30 lakh war veterans and war widows. But the agitating army veterans objected to some proposals. While the government has proposed to revise the pension every five years, the veterans wanted reviewed every year. Medals are is a recognition by the nation of the sacrifice done by the armed forces and that to an individual. Burning them, returning them is an insult of the nation and insult of the defense force itself. I don't appreciate that. That is, uh, let, the, let, let them put it before the commission, the commission or the judicial committee, they will address it. I think you should read. Today, if I start reading something, it will become allegation. I don't want to. Let them prove themselves that it is not political. On the other side, all the sports news, India aims to extend its lead as it prepares to take on South Africa in the second test from tomorrow. All that and more on the other side.
Tales that inspire stories of social change. A salute to diversity, promoting public discourse. Events that motivate, inspiring the innovative spirit. Watch Rajya Sabha television documentaries every Friday at 10.30 p.m., Saturday 12.30 p.m. and Sunday at 1 p.m. Welcome back. You're watching the news tonight. Time for some international news now. And backed by U.S.-led airstrikes, the Kurdish forces reclaimed the town of Sinjar in Iraq that was under siege by Islamic State militants. It marks a key victory for the coalition forces in their offensive against the militant group that's spreading its control across Iraq and neighboring regions. A day after launching an offensive to recapture the Iraqi town of Sinjar, Turkish fighters waved their flags on a number of buildings and government offices on Friday. Claiming full control of the town, Kurdish fighters said they attacked the IS from all directions with help from U.S. forces. The offensive began early at dawn of Thursday. Backed by U.S.-led air forces, some 7,500 Kurds cut off the town from three fronts. Within hours, they successfully blocked main roads and secured much ground. The coalition says some 60 to 70 militants had been killed in the airstrikes. The Iraqi army has now launched an offensive to recapture the western city of Ramadi from Islamic State militants. <laughs> So we do not expect that this is going to be an easy fight, um, but we do have confidence in, these, uh, in the forces, the Iraqi Kurdish forces there who have shown their capability in the past. Uh, and with the support of coalition, uh, with the support of the coalition, particularly the air campaign, uh, we think this is uh, an opportunity to deal ISIL uh, a blow. The victory will provide much-needed momentum to the Iraqi government and the Kurdish forces in their fight against the IS. The group is believed to have killed or enslaved thousands of Yazidis when they captured Sinjar in August last year. Many more became trapped on nearby Mount Sinjar without food or water for days until they were rescued by Syrian Kurdish forces. The risk of genocide was a key factor in the U.S. decision to launch airstrikes in Iraq. Bureau report, Rajasabha TV. The Lebanon is reeling from a double suicide bombing that killed at least 43 in the capital Beirut. Hezbollah strongholds were the main targets of the attack, but the group said it will continue to fight terror and send fighters to Syria to fight the Islamic State. Twin suicide bombings rocked Lebanon's capital on Thursday. The deadliest in Beirut since 1990. At least 41 people died, while over 200 were injured. The Islamic State claimed responsibility for the coordinated attacks in Burj al Barajne, a mainly Shiite southern suburb, and Hezbollah stronghold. Lebanese Prime Minister Tamam Salim has called for unity in the face of the attacks. Lebanon is holding a day of national mourning in the memory of the deceased. The first bomber detonated his explosive vest outside a Shia mosque, while the second blew himself up inside a nearby bakery. The third bomber failed to detonate his explosives and was found dead at the second blast site. These were the first attacks in more than a year on Hezbollah stronghold. Hezbollah has stepped up its involvement in the Syrian war, backing Assad's government in their fight against Sunni insurgents, including Islamic State. 
Hezbollah said they will not be deterred by the attacks. وما جرى اليوم يؤكد أننا نسير على الطريق الصح وأن هذه المعركة مستمرة بوجه الإرهاب وهذه المعركة ليست قصيرة معركة طويلة بيننا وبينهم وبين الشعب اللبناني كله وبين هذه القوى الإرهابية. Washington has condemned the blast, saying it would only serve to reinforce commitments to fighting terrorism. Bureau Report, Rajasthan TV. The Myanmar's opposition, National League for Democracy, has won a landslide election victory, ending decades of military-backed rule. Myanmar's election commission announced 83% uh, of the results, showing that uh, the Party of Democracy champion Aung San Suu Kyi has won a majority in parliament. The party has more than two-thirds seats it needs to choose the president. While with votes still being counted, the NLD's tally rose to 369 seats today. The final tally is not expected for several days. The process of choosing a new president will begin in January when parliament reconvenes. Suu Kyi, though, is banned from becoming president by the junta-drafted constitution because her children are foreign nationals. Let's now take a look at some other international news stories and global buzz. The United States carried out airstrikes in Syria, Syria targeting Jihadi John, the Islamic State uh, militant, the man behind beheading hostages in gruesome videos. The Pentagon said it was still evaluating the effectiveness of the strike in the Syrian city of Raqqa, the de facto capital of the Islamic State. Dressed in Italian black, Jihadi John became a menacing symbol of IS brutality and is one of the world's most wanted men. Secret design plans of a huge Russian nuclear torpedo were accidentally broadcast on two Kremlin-controlled television stations. During a meeting between President Vladimir Putin as high and his high mil military high command, the camera cut away to a gentle staring at plans of the torpedo system. The Kremlin later confirmed that the shots shouldn't have been broadcast. The World Bank approved a $500 million loan to Pakistan after the government fulfilled over half a dozen conditions. It includes setting up an independent entity to buy electricity from producers and also agreed to set up the Central Power Purchasing Guarantee Limited. The loan, slated to be issued in April, was delayed due to the government's failure to implement key conditions imposed by the bank. Republican presidential candidate Donald Trump launched a scathing attack on his most significant rival, re retired neurosurgeon Ben Carson. Trump, who addressed supporters at an election rally in Iowa, said Carson had described himself pathological in his memoir. He also said the man with whom he recently treated the lead in national polls was an enigma. Some sports now, and India will take on South Africa in the second test from Saturday in Chennai. After winning the first test comprehensively, India is likely to field debutant all-rounder Gurki Ratman. He was added to the side after the team management released three players, Rohit Sharma, Stuart Bini and Nishan Sharma, to play domestic matches. Meanwhile, South African all-rounder Jean-Paul Dumini, who missed the first test due to injury, was declared fit to play in the second. South African team, however, is reeling under a series of injuries. Premier fast bowler Dale Stein has a groin injury and Vernon Philanders ruled himself out of the series. South African batsman A.B. De Villiers, though, is set to play his 100th test match. He's earned his call-up um, and um, he does certainly does fit in the scheme of things and uh, don't be surprised if you, if you see him playing uh, very soon. So, um, yeah, he brings in that balance and I wish him all the luck. He brings a lot of know-how, a lot of experience to the, to the, low, to the middle order uh, and his offspin has been very vital for us over the many years. So, although he hasn't played a, few, uh, hasn't played a game in the last two weeks, um, his training has been superb and, and hopefully he has a good game too. Well, that's the news tonight. Good night.